um, rules. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the, the rules of the opening, the rules of the middle game, and I didn't find all of this in the first book, for example. It is in the second one. Uh, Normally, that's the, the, that's the, the logical need is one of the things the step method pays most attention to. So when it's not covered, normally it means that it shouldn't be discussed yet because it's too complex. I mean, like I said, everything is built in, in, in blocks. And for example, you need to understand that, for example, the middle game is about uh, time, right? I mean, spatial, you need to connect a lot of things and relate them to each other. So that's uh, something you need conceptually to go through in your development. And as I said already, for example, with MATE, you're already working with two concepts, right? And, and then from two concepts, you need to deliver MATE, which is already complex. Uh, well, I mean, you need to build it up. Um, when it comes to these kind of things in, in, in positional play, uh, that's even more complex. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, you have to make so many extra steps. Uh, it's the same as in the beginning, for example, when children are capturing material just right and, and not uh, the king is still a moving piece, um, those kind of things. So this material phase and the spatial phase they more or less determine uh, where the children are and what is uh, what they're capable of, of doing. Um, if you want to diversify, because that's also what I hear in your voice and that the step method is not diversifying enough, that's the part where you can include the mini games, right? Um, one of the things uh, I think I showed, um, well, one of the nicest things, for example, here. Um, this is one thing I do quite often. Oh, sorry. This is one interesting mini game which you can play on each level. Um, it's like four in a row. Um, so for example, here, uh, of course, if, if it's white to move, how we can uh, win the game. So you need to get four pieces in a row, right? It's like like this or like this or on a diagonal. Oh, you move the uh, knight? The knight, right? Well, let's say that is d8. Uh, so the knight to d8, right? And then you can have four in a row. So if the king moves, then black can have four in a row. So what you do is that you place the pieces at the board. Nothing can be captured and you just move the pieces around. From which lesson we can more or less do this game? When can we start, for example, doing this lesson? I mean, how much knowledge children should have in order to play this game? To move the pieces? Yeah, almost, right? So it means that almost from lesson three, you can do this. Imagine that I have this board four to four and I place the kings in the corner and I put coins in the middle. Why this is one of the games I like to start with, for example, and what can we all learn from it? You understand the idea, right? I mean, to understand the space. Yeah, they understand the space and you can understand the, the way how they can, um, for example, uh, uh, find roots to certain coins. And I mean, in the beginning, I do everything is one coin. What's good about it to, to play this kind of game is because that every child will always have some success because they always will collect some coins. I mean, to collect no coins is almost impossible. So they always collect some coins, right? And if you collect eight and I collect six, it doesn't feel I really lost. You did a little better, but okay. I mean, children know that some are a little better than the others, right? So in the beginning, you do one point. Then, for example, the second time I do, the again, every coin has... Let me do it on the other board. This may be easier. So here we have this kind of board. Let's, let's set it up. Let's set it up. Hmm. Right, so you can do the kings in the middle. Then we do the pawns. Doesn't matter which color, because that's a good thing about even chess base, right? Illegal positions are these days allowed. So yes, we do it. Where is it? Here it is. So 
we go here. So even this, you can do, for example, an online lesson. Quite good. I do it quite often, especially when they're young. So, um, well, I mean, how this aim, game normally will end when, more or less, when you play this? Alice, what do you think? I think... Right now, we only have one black on the board, so they will be end up with definitely a winning game for white. No, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, all this, these are coins, right? I can't make yeah. coins, just based. So they're all at one point. So there's no white and black. So there's like, just based only gives me white and black pawns. Normally, I would put coins, blue coins, right? There's neutral coins. So you take, I take. You take, I take. So how this game, the game will end? So whoever moves first will be winning the game. So do when we agree? The coins, so Sorry? Taken, when all the coins are taken? Yeah, all the time. But so it will be 7-7, seven, seven, right? Because it's not very exciting. <laughs> you take half, I take half because we are playing East or um, what, right? So the first thing, normally, every child should have some succeed. So even the, the, let's say, the worst kids in the class can have success, right? This is important because you want to involve them in every action. So then, of course, I can change them and I can say that, for example, the middle four, I can color them, for example, those are two and the rest is one. So why, what am I learning, for example, variety in, in this kind of game? Sorry, actually, I didn't get the first first one. I thought that for the first game, each, each pawn is one so, is one point, right? Is one coin. So each yeah. of us uh, and and we are playing. So black takes one, white takes one. So yeah, but um, one. with the possibilities, whoever moves first should be winning. No, because it's seven seven, right? Yeah, but if they if they happen to go in the right the, the same direction, so the, the there's a first move advantage, right? <laughs> I, I understand. It's not understand. fair for the different students. I understand, but I mean, I can I play this game. I think for hundreds of children when they're starting, and also all of them, they're just kind of collecting it in a very equal, easy way. They're oh, not okay. randomly taking around. And then, of course, if you're smart and when you're thinking, uh, well, then maybe the game can end in a result. But that's not happening with at least my experience. So, and then in the worst case, even if you win the game with 8-6, then still I collect the six coins, right? You just collected a little bit more. Like, I mean, if you have eight candies and I have six candies, I still can enjoy my six candies, right? I mean, no child will... Uh, maybe you have stomach ache because you had eight, right? So for children, eight, six is kind of fine result, right? And, and the, the most important thing is you want children to have success, that they feel like they achieve something. So this is night game. So now I, we go to the second step. For example, now if I say these coins are two points and the rest is one point, what will happen, Adina? Nice exercise for you. You want a little bit of challenge for uh, more advanced children. So when I'm... Um, when I'm making these two points and the rest one, what kind of extra learning effect it might have by increasing? That they will learn that the center is more important than the rest? Yeah. I mean, you can have a lot of lectures about the center is the most important thing and tell them, but I can also let them play games where always in the middle, they are the strongest point and automatically they feel that in the center, that's the place to be. So it's quite interesting is that very often we try to talk in words to do something while you can also just kind of, well, a little bit manipulate them in a good way that they learn that the center is the more, most important thing. Uh, then what will I learn more about the children when I'm making this kind of exercise? Because I like love these games, especially in the beginning to learn what from the children. Variety. Well, how? What we? I mean, if you give this in class, what? What will? How could it help you? What, uh, Andina, sorry, one moment. Let me. Uh, variety first, please. Um. Well, I think that you would start to see um, which children ha were were really good at applying sort of logic and uh, um, thinking ahead as to uh, what the you know thinking about the moves rather than just. Uh, moving. Uh, I think that's the sort of key thing. I have mixed ability classes 
and um, some children just seem to move the pieces around without a clear vision and others have 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 really grasped the fact they've got to think they've got to think ahead they've got to use their logic so I think if you had games like this around the room you'd start to quite quickly see which children are perhaps have got better board vision and better thinking skills than others yeah absolutely yeah absolutely thank you yeah and Dina you have something to add uh, no, I was thinking when I asked the children to play with the kings, some of them, they will only move it straight. They cannot move it diagonally. Exactly. But, <laughs> but, but also, also, I mean, this, exactly. And this is also the point, because if I, uh, at some point I switch the kings to rooks and then, and then they play the rooks like it's a king, right? And not like the rook can also move along. So you see all kinds of consequences already in the thinking, because very often you think, but that's obvious. But that's not obvious for a lot of children, right? And all these kind of small things can identify you what kind of child needs what kind of instruction uh, for the next step. So for me, this is an amazing way of not having being disturbed by all these pieces and playing full games, but first trying to understand the child. I think in the in the beginning, it's so much more fun to understand the child and how the child is thinking and what is needed, because these kind of things. Uh, if you, for example, you train 12 to, to 1500, do you think that if you have the knowledge and you make this kind of games from the very beginning with the children, it will help you to also increase them later on in the process when they are using uh, calculation techniques and so on? I, I don't know. I didn't use this. But they know the concept of the center and everything. They know everything theoretically. They know what they but, have to but, do. But the point is that it's not only theoretical, but it's also like how, for example, if I give them a rule, for example, I mean, before I was saying with the hamburger, right? Some kids can really execute the hamburger, for example, in a very exact way, and they just make them. Some kids are struggling because they want to invent something new. They said to teachers at hamburger, but I want to do whatever, right? So all these kind of things help me to understand that also later on when I give them some theory, I know how they will react to theory. Some will kind of try to refute my theory for whatever reason, and others will try to execute. Sorry? Even the castle, some uh, in the beginning, they don't want to castle. They First, they listen to me. They say, okay, I castle. Then they got checkmated in H7 or G7. Then they said, you see, castle is bad. At least when I was in the middle, I didn't get checkmated. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's that fine. And then I said, okay, let's have some more situations. For me, this is perfect. I love discussion because with discussion, learning starts because then you can kind of say, okay, but what happened to the king? So is the castling the problem or maybe you didn't uh, control the center? I mean, uh, what is happening here, right? And then you can try to figure out what is more important and how the things work. Um, actually, um, I did this game and I have one, two and, and, and three points or, uh, and, 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 and they, they can pile up, right? Because they are, they're like uh, round coins and you can stack them. Mm -hmm. So what's kind of interesting, one time I said, I need to go to the toilet and, 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 and the student, you say, you can set up the board and it was a small boy. So what of course the boy did because I had a big bag full of these coins. So you were stacking them like uh, skyscrapers, right? It's just like, a... so at that time I was thinking, okay, probably he likes Armageddon. So this game was even invented by him uh just by uh, by chance and and then the interesting thing is so if a child of six year old is making these skyscrapers with a lot of points so what as a teacher i feel like i won most of the game already why maybe he will uh, win material he will like collecting pieces later but the, the, well, maybe, but the point is uh, a child of six year old, what, in what kind of phase of learning they are? What are they learning? Calculation. To count is something very difficult. So if they have to count above 10 or above 20, that's the real challenge. So if they have to count till 30 or 40, I'm happy because that's something they need to learn, right? And if they have positive emotions with a good learning success, and they associate it with chess, then automatically chess is in the corner of the positive things they want to keep in their lives later on. At least I try to build it as much as possible. So the more positive connections I can make, the longer they will stay with chess. Uh, one of the questions, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot who exactly was saying, what should I do with girls for 16, 18 when they want to quit chess, right? Um, 
And I think it's not only with, uh, well, with, with girls, I would say it's with boys as well. I had a lot of boys with 1900 ratings, good ratings, and they just quit chess. So in my opinion, uh, the, the main point is they don't see it as part or vital part of the development and something which is just fun in their life and contributes something. Because I feel if you feel like something is worthwhile, you, st you keep it in your life and it doesn't matter what it is. And, and so the same counts for chess. So the more positive connections and relationships you make from the very beginning, uh, the, the, the bigger the chances are they keep chess in long term. And I don't think there's a big difference between girls and boys in this aspect. Of course, the girls is more visible because there are less of them, especially um, after uh, secondary school, uh, you see uh, it reduces even more. Um, but uh, because it's also quite interesting, under 12, you see that the girls very often win the championships. Even Unipolga won under 12 and not under 14, 16, 18. Uh, in the Netherlands, we had a lot of champions uh, under 12. Girls are always one, second, third, or first. When it comes to 14, there's no goal even coming close. So you see that actually in this age, the boy make the, the biggest step. So what we need to do is that they need to be uh, so good, the, the girls, uh, when they're uh, up to 12, that they can more or less, when the, the boys make this, this next step, they can still compete. So we shouldn't be happy when the girls are reasonably good. They need, they need to be exceptionally good because they need to be in, an, they have an advantage in the beginning. But that's also, it's a little bit like uh, the his, uh, industry, right? This is the, the advantage of, um, of being the first. I mean, in the, in the beginning, it's a, it's a privilege to be first because, uh, but then in the end, everybody can copy you and then you're the last, right? So that's always in this, in this development curve. So also think about it in this way. So when girls are reasonably good uh, and can compete with boys under 12, that's not good enough. I mean, for the girls, we need to set higher goals if we really want them to preserve for the chess world. And I think that's also something very important. Uh, Paul girls also make their statements uh, in favor of it. Uh, that uh, girls need to be uh, competing with boys from the very beginning and also with adults. Because if you, if you set your goals too low then, uh, or the bar too low, then of course at some point other interests will come. I think that uh, also important is that you try to uh, uh, connect uh, things not only to professional and, and competition, but also to the other advantages. Uh, like it's a little bit like a social environment and everything. But of course, we have to be honest, the chess world is not doing a very good service in this way. Um, uh, unfortunately, I wish I could tell more positive things, but unfortunately, uh, chess world is not, uh, yeah, it's not always uh, very suitable in this way or aspect. Um, still a thing that uh, I had even even a, one of my strongest grandmas, so some were very competitive like Kasparov. They really want to crush their opponent and they were really like eager to, to fight. But some, they like chess as an intellectual challenge. And I had uh, also equally strong grandmas with 2650 and actually they didn't like this competitive part, but they just liked the intellectual part. And they always saw it as a an, an way of uh, conquering their own... Uh, well, thinking or their own um, kind of borders they wanted to overcome, right? So also I think in this way, we, we need to find maybe new sources of how to inspire girls or ladies um, later on also why chess can provide them with something uh, more valuable later on. Uh, and maybe, maybe that's also something uh, we need you for it uh, to give also more clues about it because you went all through all this process. You're still sticking with chess. So maybe you should be telling me what is needed more than I should tell you because it's always quite funny, right? It's maybe a little bit... Um, because this is also quite funny, right? Women in one way are far too modest. Uh, I'm sorry for the anecdote, but I heard this anecdote last week, but it's quite funny. It was about breastfeeding. And there, were, uh, there was a room full of women and there was one man and they, and they were asking the question if breastfeeding was easy or not. And guess who was the only one who said it was easy? 
<laughs> it was the man. So can you imagine that one with zero experience and no idea of what he is talking about? He had even the, the guts to say that he had he was an expert in this field while all the women were saying his stuff, and I don't know exactly. So this is the kind of thing, right? We need to also stand up for ourselves and 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 to claim um that that we that we are knowing something and that we are capable of, of showing how we can be experts right and or uh and and what is worth fighting for i think also telling stories like i did before about my past but you need to find maybe more female stories but that's not something i need to teach you you need to teach me what should be told, right? That's the, the webinar. If you one of you will give one time a webinar, what are the hero, female hero stories? I would love to hear them. But that's something you need. You, I need to hear from you, right? I mean, this is something you need to, or talk to each other about what this we're fighting for, for girls or what could be different uh, than the other way around. Does anybody have one story where you feel like that's something maybe worthwhile uh, sharing? Because let's be honest, if we are silent, it means that we are silent to our girls who want to learn chess now and will quit later chess, right? That's the point. For me, being silent is okay, but we need to understand to whom we are silent. You're not silent to me. You're silent to all the girls who wants to learn chess now, who wants to stick with the chess, and you need to give them a reason not to. Your story needs to inspire them to keep on moving. Well, I, I have uh, not very outstanding examples, but one of my students told me that the reason that she would love to stay within the chess industry, it was because she noticed that there's less competitions among girls. That's the first place. And um, she can use it as a leverage to go to universities much easier than the guys. So that kind of very straightforward incentives encourage her a lot within staying within until 16, 17, 18, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so so what is the good thing and the bad thing about it this, this aspect theoretically saying it should be the same competition level among boys and the girls but um, statistically it's not girls probably have less competitors compared to the boys yeah yeah, it is true. And also uh, the fact that, of course, at some point, if it's not competitive, how will you remain in the chess world, right? That's also one point which is always challenging. I mean, uh, of course, on all kinds of level, you can just well observe chess or be. Um, if you look now, for example, um, uh, and in some way, this is kind of interesting. What do you feel like uh, the the female chess players have one huge advantage over men at this, at this very moment. Monica, what do you think? Well, the females can play for female competition and open competitions. So that's one thing, absolutely. One good point, one more. I've I said mean, my <laughs> Okay, if we, if we look to Twitch, Yeah, people will look at them because they are women. <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, I mean, if you see what kind of rating, uh, I mean, we have in the Netherlands, we have one streamer. She has seventeen hundred, and she has so uh, I mean, thousand more followers uh, than just the grandmasters in our uh, own country, right? I mean, uh, she hardly plays chess. She just she's just learning chess, and she's just learning it online, and everybody is watching it for every fifty, sixty thousand. Uh, she has, of course, nice look. Uh, but can you imagine that the grandma is working all his life to get the, <laughs> some kind of followers and just a random girl who just started to learn chess is, has already 60,000 followers just by, well, having a nice look. And, but in, in one way, you can say this is unfair. On the other hand, I say you need to use all your tactics which you can. And if this is, an, let's say, a tool towards, a, let's say, a bigger goal, why not? 
right? I mean, but you need to always to keep in mind. And Polgar said it. I think that's a very good. At some point, you need to choose, right? Kostinjuk, for, for example, he was a little bit also saying Kostinjuk was paying a lot of attention to Owers, um fashion and 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 everything around. As he said, well, you need to choose. Either you want to be good in chess, or you want to well have this kind of uh glamour around it like in the queen's gambit right it's just the the question if you can combine it or not in the queen's gambit i think it's one of the favors where where i feel like uh it was done in a very nice way where it was they they were combining both they were really showing her how she developed herself as a woman but also as a chess player and how she managed to combine both I have a highly big respect for it um, to combine both. Even Kostinjuk, let's be honest, she became world champion and had just a child in the same year, or it was close to one year or something like this. And I think this is, uh, I think it's very respectable. And I think that's also some, some kind of stories that need to be shared much more. That these kind of things is never about that people say you need to career or you need family life and it can't be both, right? Uh, there are examples and of course it's not easy not at all but it's possible right so these kind of stories i think also uh, read about it because in my opinion that's the stories you need to tell because if i tell it it's still it's still nice but i think that if a female tells it it makes much more uh sense and in in, in the way that is correct right so also this is something uh, feel eager to, to learn your stories and, and retell them uh, and share them together because I think that's something very important because uh, girls need to understand they have role models also who uh, went the way in front of them. I can I just say something that um, I yeah. heard that the women's voices were um, made silent um, in medieval time in the 6th, 17th century when there was a witch hunt. So about 60,000 women were killed in Europe only. And since then, the women learned to keep their heads down, didn't want to be wise, didn't want to be equal to men. As before that, they had more power. And it's kind of a leftover for hundreds of years since the witch hunts as well. That's what I heard one of the stories when women are more silent and keeping their heads down still. I think that the history is uh, full of, uh, uh, I would say, positive and negative uh, well developments like this. But let's be honest, uh, the right to vote is also something which happened uh, also later on. And all kind of history, uh, Women's Day still exists and all kinds of other days they come. But it's, in my opinion, the, I have, in my study, I had a lot of female studies. And I think one of the interesting thing about female studies is not about rights of women. It's more about uh, rethinking how we want to think. And we then, that we don't take this patriarch uh, way of concepts uh, as accepted and as, the, uh, and as how it is. And to rethink, uh, for example, the elements, right? Because you have this famous picture where there's a giraffe and there's an elephant and so on. And, and you're, you're testing all kinds of skills. And if you, for example, say climb in a tree and you say it to, to the hippo, well, it doesn't make sense because the hippo is not jumping, right? And the giraffe will always win. But I mean, if you say, uh, for example, uh, well, move, uh, move uh, away, then of course the hippo or the elephant will win because they are so strong that whatever bird will do there, nothing will happen, right? So everybody has their own qualities. And I think one of the most important thing about it is that if female rethink their position in chess world and want to establish that more girls are wanted to stay in this chess world, you need to think about your stories and which kind of elements you want to give to them. What do you want? I mean, and, and mainly I think is always stay very close to yourself. Go through your career and what kind of things you would like to tell to yourself when you are small. Just think very simple like that. Uh, Ferreira, please. Right. Um, what, what I sometimes tell my, well, what, what I often tell my chess children, I do have a lot of girls in the group. I have a lot of girls in my groups at, ju at junior level, so age seven and eight, and they are in the chess club because of the prizes. So I have a lot of prizes for puzzles and they're all stationary. They'll be special pens with unicorns on the top. And initially they probably come to chess club just because They've seen other children with these prizes and they want some for themselves. And then when they get to chess club, 
they start to engage in it. So bringing them in has not actually been about them wanting to learn chess. It's been about them wanting to earn the prizes. But often, often what I will tell them is, is that when I was at primary school, and I'm quite old now, probably the oldest in the room, but when I was at primary school, um, the girls weren't allowed in the chess club. It was the boys in the chess club. And um, I got onto the school team by accident because one day on the minibus ready to go, someone was sick and they suddenly needed another player. And I, I played chess a lot at home with my father and a friend across the road. And this friend, boy, was in the chess team. And so in that last moment, he said, well, I know Verity can play well. So I was summoned out of my classroom, put on this minibus, and off we went to this other school. Um, and, and that was great fun for me because I had to have no ability to be able to join in with that before. But you're treated differently. I mean, OK, I'm the only girl on the team. I'm the only girl on the minibus. I'm not treated quite in the same way. There's a sort of, um, um, I don't know, just a sort of almost like we'll pat you on the back because you're the token female here. It's like nothing to do with how well I play chess. They're just sort of being kind. And I found that in my work as a chess club leader. If I take my school team off to a tournament, I mean, it is much better now. But very often with all the other coaches, there might be three female coaches at this big tournament. All the others will be men. I don't quite know why, but I think there is a history of it being very male dominated and quite hard for, for, for girls to to get into it and then succeed with it, do you know? Yeah, I fully agree. And that's how we started the lesson also today. I think one of the reasons why we made this kind of webinars is that we need to share more knowledge together. We need to learn more. Um, and I think this is something very vital uh, that this kind of unright uh, in history, we still exist. Um, we keep fighting for it. And I don't know if uh, I would uh, definitely advise you to follow Susa Bogar, um, beside what you think about it personally. But I think that she does a really great job in, in emphasizing and writing about her development and, and, and writes uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of history, how this, you, they all went through this process. Because I mean, in that time, it was not, they were not only female, they were also born in, in Eastern Europe, right? So in every single way, they had a lot of resistance from every cultural, uh, organizational uh, structure you can imagine. Um, and still they were thinking, well, I'm not giving up and I'm fighting for my right because that's, I want to be in the chess world and that's it, right? But if you say it would have been so much better when they treat us much easier and much more equal and so on, I still feel that that's uh, what it's supposed to be. Um, but I still think that if we don't speak ourselves uh, loud out um, uh, and we voice uh, ourselves, then it will never be heard. Because most of the people will not even realize how unjust uh, this, this world is in this aspect still, in a lot of ways. So I still think that's our main task, uh, voice ourselves, uh, also un unify ourselves in this, um, so that in the end, um, yeah, we can make the change. Thank you for sharing. Um, Let's go. Um, so th this was a little bit the mini game, right? So I want to go through a little bit the um, some of the uh, things we have maybe seen a little bit last time, but still I think it's very vital if in understanding uh, how to develop ourselves. And Chachana, yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add one little thing that um, I once read an interesting article on where they asked um, female GMs who already um, finished their career, why they started um, doing so much for girls and women after their career. And they answered that you cannot be a professional player and sort of a feminist at the same time, because you have your full career to take care of, just like the men do. And they also don't take care of other men men rights or something yeah. like that that's why um at their time of course they saw the problems and they experienced them themselves but it was very hard for them to find the time or energy to fight it because the main goal was actually to prove 
or to be a feminist while proving that women can play chess too. So I yeah. think it's also very interesting to keep that in mind that at the same time they have the same career that a man does and not the same problem. No, I agree. I very good point. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I want to just to go through several materials because also we have the theoretical, theoretical part of this training, right? We have a little bit about, well, developing a way of thinking, having some nice ideas, uh, but also a little bit the theoretical. So one of the things which I always find very vital, and it doesn't matter which question we are answering, is that AD is an explicit direct instruction. Um, I like this picture quite a lot. Uh, I know it's Dutch, so if you say I can't read it, uh, uh, I hope that, and that's what I also think, is that the picture itself shows everything. And that's what also is very strong. So always keep in mind that children very often, especially when they're young, they can't read, right? So what they do, they look to pictures. So even if you don't speak the language, that's, then you're in the same position as a five-year-old child or a six-year-old child who hardly read, right? So they always look to your behavior and to the picture and not to what you are saying. And, and this is also maybe one of the most important things also. Can you um, understand why a child normally always an, a, isn't listening to your words, but only looking to your behavior? How come? How come that this behavior is so strong in children? And often quite annoyed by the adults, right? Does anybody know? Because they are in the stage of imitation. And they learn this from the parents and but imagine that imagine that you're let's say two years old. Do, can you speak? No. Do you know do you know any language? So what is the only thing a child can do? You see the behavior of the the others. <laughs> And then you try to copy it because you think that's the only thing that makes sense because you see, if I do this, my mom gives me a hug. Hug feels like pleasant. So you think, okay, let's keep this behavior, right? So let's something like this. If I do that, mom gives me like this or I don't know some words or something. You don't understand what she's saying, but you know for sure that it's not good. <laughs> so so the interesting thing is that, uh, that whatever happens is like, uh, you see very in beginning, they understand that the behavior is what is counting because the rest, it doesn't exist for them. Of course, later on, the words make sense. But in the beginning, uh, later on, it doesn't matter anymore because already so much in their core, they understand that the behavior is much stronger than the words. But let's be honest, actually, children are much more fair than we think because very often people say one thing to you while the behavior is doing something else. I mean, you 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 say they say you're welcome, but you feel in behavior there, you're not that welcome, right? I mean, the, even the, uh, the example of variety before, right? You see one thing they are telling and the other thing they are doing. So we know that doing is much more stronger than telling. And actually in the children in this aspect are maybe even wiser than many adults, right? Because they just look what is happening. So also I say that very often parents say, my child needs uh, need to do homework or he's not doing homework. And if he's not doing homework, then he, he's not going to classes. Adina, did you manage? Did you happen to such kind of situations with adults or? Uh, you mean he, they are not coming to chess classes? Because yeah, because parents are saying, yeah, only if he's doing homework, I'm spending my money on, on classes or something like this, if uh, the child is not doing. And do you know what is my command normally? when these kind of things are saying, because they are saying they are lazy and they are not doing their homework. So I'm not investing money when they are not kind of doing something with chess. Mm. So no, no, it's, 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 <laughs> sorry, what's the, the kids who are coming to chess, they are quite good in school. I don't uh, really the, yeah. No, but it's not only school, right? It's also with chess, right? The chess homework or something like this. After they are lazy with chess, yeah. That's another story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm talking about chess, only the chess part. Uh, so, so, but very often pa parents say the children are very lazy in the chess homework. And if they are not doing their homework, they don't, they are not paying for lessons anymore. Or something like this. I don't know. At least in the Netherlands, it's quite common. And my reaction is always, but if they are not doing homework, it means that you're not doing anything at home. Because the children are just copying you. I'm sorry. 
the kids, because the parents, they should push the children, of course. And no, no, they shouldn't push. They should do homework. If you want your children to work in the in your step books, then work in your step books yourself. Kids are copying. If you're if you're sitting lazy and eating chips on the bank, kids will do the same thing. If you're sitting on your iPad, kids will do the same thing. If you're reading a book, kids will read a book. If you're working in your step book and you're making chess puzzles, kids will start making chess puzzles. It's very simple. If the kids are not doing it, you're not doing it. I'm not, don't blame me. That's just how it works. Children are just representing the mirror of what your behavior, and if you like it or not, it's just representing you. And of course, this is very painful from time to time because you hope that you can do one thing and you can tell another thing and you get a better result, but that's not how children work. You get the fair deal. And as I said, I mean, so many parents tell me from, uh, well, we will start the lesson again when he will start working. And then I said, well, the children only will start working if you're starting working. And that's something very hard in some way, but that's very fair. And also when you say, uh, if the children are quitting chess, think about what are the parents doing? How are they very uh, permanent or doing with their hobbies? If the parents are uh, sticking to the hobbies and, and, and keeping these things for life, children will do exactly the same thing. If they change it on the dime, children will change it on the dime as well. You can't change it anything. Parents have a vital role in this whole uh, example. Again, we have this role examples, right? You're, I mean, if you're sticking to chess and you think chess is the most greatest thing and you give this example for them, then children think, okay, if this is so valuable for the trainer, I want to learn why it's so valuable for him or why it's so valuable for her, right? And that's something why I feel as a trainer and a teacher, you need to show the example. And if you're not doing it, why are you telling it to your students? You can't have it both, right? I mean... That's the tough thing. And I'm not saying it's easy, but you always need to realize that's the, the, the fair deal with children. They just copying. So, and, uh, sorry, yes, please, Ava. Uh, so I kind of have to teach the parents. What are well, you telling me? Yeah, kind of. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling, I had one mom, she said, my child wants to be good chess player. And I said, are you playing chess? No. Are you doing any hobby? No. Then I said, I'm, I'm not sure if I can uh, help her. Because the point is, if you're not giving the right example, she will not do it either. And then, uh, and then we, 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 we spent a lot of time, but in the end, you always lose it. I know that I, as a trainer, as again, I'm very modest. I know my influence. If I have a couple of hours a week maximum, I cannot, I cannot compete with a parent. I'm not strong enough like this, right? I can teach them something. And now, of course, in, in a lot of ways, I can keep them for some time. But overall, uh, long term, I will always defeat to the parents' habits. And that's something I just know. Uh, nothing to be done. I don't see it as positive. I don't see it as negative. So I just bring it back to the parents. I said, if you want this, always understand you have to do it yourself. And it doesn't have to be in the same field, right? So if one is a hockey player and the other wants to be a ballerina, that's fine. As long as you stick to it and you put the effort and you go every single day to this kind of hobby, then the child will do the same thing. And it's kind of funny. I have even one parent and for example, the, uh, the boy I was talking about, right? The boy who didn't want to do his homework. So when mom has lesson, then she sends him out and said, now it's my lesson. I don't want to be disturbed. So, and you understood that already from the boy that he very often he didn't like the lesson, right? Or he was a little bit like, uh, but now what happened? He had a small uh, uh, sister. Another small sister also get lesson. So what happens now? Now he's claiming this is my half an hour go away. And then it's, her name is Dasha. So she said, uh, <laughs> so the interesting thing, now he's kind of claiming his territory of lesson before he didn't want to have lesson. Now he's claiming his territory like mom. This is my half an hour. And now he's working in a book, but he's not working in a book. And I said, well, again, why is not working in a book? Can we draw the conclusion? Mom is not doing it. Mom is too busy. 
I don't blame you that you're too busy. I'm just saying, if you're not giving the example, it's not happening. Okay, so no, every My mother Sorry? was a play chess and I still became a WGM. <laughs> no, no, I mean, as I said, your mom is maybe not GM, but she is something very good in something else. It can be cooking. It can be uh, uh, cleaning the house in a very precise way, whatever. I know for sure that if you are so determined that you can become a double GM, your mom is a superhero. I don't know the, well, what. You, you probably can tell me much better in what. But I know for sure that the, her determination she gave to you or your dad gave it to you, right? And, and, and both, they, they gave you something in your DNA and in your education. Because I know for sure that if you manage to be so good and so devoted in one thing, that's something your parents gave you in some way. I don't know. I need to know you better. I mean, to, to know exactly where. Father so, father. so father or mother, it doesn't matter. But then even uh, even your mom, if, if your father gave you determination, then your mom maybe gave you, I don't know, the relaxedness to, for, uh, for uh, I don't know, to proceed when you're not successful, right? Your mom has the probably other futures, which probably you used in your way of career. Because we know that every uh, every future, is always a, a small block and like a mini block which built us as a chess player. And every, and every uh, character feature is good in itself. And the balance will make you a better player in the long term, right? But always keep in mind that whatever happens, the parents more or less are giving you the building blocks on which you can build your career, whatever it will be. And I think that's, and then I think that's always something. Uh, Friday, please. I think what you have said is obviously very, very true, that we we uh, children take a lot of their behaviour copying the patterns that they see in their parents. But as chess teachers, I think we can be role models to the children. We, I, I certainly can't be educating all the parents of all the children that I've got in my chess groups. There's just, there's just not possible. I also can't um, I can't really criticize what they're doing at home. I haven't got time to find out what they're doing at home. The only thing I've actually got control over is what's happening in my room, in my lesson, at my time. And I can, and, and, and children, they need positive role models and their parents hopefully are positive role models. I can be a positive role model. But um, I, I teach in a mixed community junior school. We have children who don't have positive role model parents. It doesn't mean that that they that they should give up and that they're never going to succeed because they don't come from a home where that education in that way is important. I've got to find a way as a teacher to to motivate them to go home and do some homework. I can't pass that to the parents. It's up to me. What what can I do to motivate those children to come back next week with pieces of paper with homework on it? So I kind of work from, at the moment, this term, we're, we're creating checkmate in one move puzzles and the best are going to be uploaded to my website so that we've got um, yeah. teaching on the website. And that in itself is really motivational because they want to be the ones with their puzzles up there with their name at the bottom. So that's completely outside of whether or not their parents are encouraging them. They come back week on week really excited to show me their bit of paper because they want theirs to be the one or one of the ones included. So I do, I do take on board what you've said. And I absolutely, children will copy their, their um, what's going on in their home. But as chess teachers, I feel like that's way out of our control. We 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 can't affect that. But I think thank you very yeah. much, and I think <laughs> you did you. a great job about motivating them and and being for them uh, all along, right? I mean, I'm I'm still here after 25 years, uh, and if I had idea that I couldn't uh, control anything because parent determined in the end, then I yeah I could give up my job right i can resign so of course i have the feeling that i can do something i just know my place in the in the the whole thing um uh, yes i can teach them chess yes i can love let them love uh chess as a very nice hobby and yes i can motivate them to come to me and and that i'm the personal motivator for them to come every single week um but i know that in the long term i will never succeed 
unfortunately, uh, because that's never strong enough. So I can be for, for the time being, and I will definitely spend all my energy and time, like you said, uh, to make the greatest time, especially when the children are already not that fortunate. If, well, let's say the best, uh, well, growing up uh, uh, phase, right? Uh, so absolutely, it's fantastic that we can do something for them. On the other hand, um, I'm also thinking that if I really want to achieve something, I need to uh, involve the parents. And especially the parents who say that they want some kind of champions or good players, I will say, well, I'm more than happy to help you, but then I'm going to look how you behave because your behavior will determine if he will become a champion or not. And that's very confronting for the parent because normally the parents hope that they can just pay the money and that's it. And then if you give these kind of things back, then they said, hmm, that was not the, the, the whole idea, right? And that's what I'm saying. Well, I mean, in some part I can take it over, but for the biggest part, I can't. Even the dad, I, I, I come back to you, Tatania. Um, the, 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 there's this, the, the, the son, he's kind of very fortunate in everything. Parents support him and everything, but there are some phases where he's not working in a book. And I said to the dad, if you want to do the favor, just build the regime, uh, build, build the routine together, do it for a couple of days, and then maybe you can try to sneak out. Maybe, maybe it will last. Uh, and maybe the child will not notice it that in the meanwhile, you're not doing anything anymore and the child is taking the, the routine, right? But I think that from time to time, you need to realize that you have always to be the first, right? It's a little bit like the boss. The best leaders are always going first in the battle or first in front of whatever uh, when there's some crisis. That's why you're always the leader. And the parents, of course, are also the leader of the process. Yes, but it's uh, challenging on the other hand. Um, and I still think, and always keep in mind that even if the parents are maybe not the best parents, if you can say it like this, they still have all kinds of futures. And the good thing about chess is that we can use anything for chess. If your patience is good, if your energy is good, if you're uh, whatever, I can make out of any feature, I can make something good, which is useful and vital for your chess. I just need to build it differently. So for me, it doesn't matter what kind of parents you have, I can always build on it. The only thing is the routines and, and, the, and the actions, I can't change those. And unfortunately, the, the routines are the ones who determine who you will become. That's even the old philosophers who are saying this. Tijana, what was your uh, question or point? Yeah, I just wanted to share a thought that I think it's also a bit different if it's like, for example, something you do in school or like a hobby you do pri privately or after school, because like when you're in school, you and all your classmates do the same thing like for example in scholastic chess you and everyone else will have homework and you'll be knowing that when you're at home your friends have this homework too but when you do you do on your own like a hobby or activity after school um you know all the others don't have this homework or don't have this hour they have to learn something in the weekend or whatever and um yeah despite of if the parents are not very helpful in that or not I I remember for example by myself for myself that was a thing um I thought a lot about when I was a kid like okay I've done my homework and everyone has homework every kid has to go to school but now it's the weekend and I still have this duties of this extra homework to do and the others do not I think that also can be a bit demotivating and hard for a kid to understand that if you really like the thing, you also have to work on the weekend and in a couple of years, you'll like earn the fruits. But at the moment, it's like hard when you're young to understand that. No, but this, yeah. I mean, that's why, I mean, those things, I mean, I always think that um, uh, reflect together is very important. For example, I had this, this one, uh, another student and we were working on it. And for example, he forgot how to mate with knight and bishop. And at some point he lost on time because he couldn't recall the theory and he was crying. And then I said, why are you crying? I mean, well, I lost on time. And I said, well, well what does it mean? It doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean that I might. It only means that we need to practice more. Or if you forget to practice and repeat, then you forget things. So that, uh, that you lost on time is just a reminder for yourself that if you don't repeat things and practice things well enough, 
then you forget. And that's actually not something worth crying for. I mean, crying, in my opinion, is only when you really, well, for, uh, you were working for a very long time, very intensively, and you had a very intensive battle. And then in the end, you didn't win it or you didn't succeed. And it was so intense, then you might cry. But if it's just like you didn't do your homework, that's not worth crying. That means that you either want to change it or you don't want to change it. For me, both things are fine. And if you want to change it, do it. If you don't want to change it, don't do it. But don't cry about something which is not worth crying. For me, it's very important. So also this is kind of important is that when you think about it, it's just all these kind of reminders why you're refraining from all kinds of social activities and doing this kind of homework is always for the bigger good. And let's be honest, we talked about the difference between a man and female players. And normally men in, in, in essence, they tend to have, they, they tend to like it more to be very monochrome and very, uh, to focus on one thing. They don't mind to spend all their lives just on chess and that's it. While female normally think there's more life than chess and there's some part is nice, but on the other hand, there are also other nice things, right? So maybe in tendency, this is true. But on the other hand, let's be honest, why if this is true, still a lot of female can be uh, very successful in a lot of areas, right? So we know that, for example, there are a lot of genius scientists, uh, female, there are a lot of, in all kinds of areas, we have fantastic women who outperform men by far. So even though that's never an argument, which I heard, right? I heard quite often that men tend to be more career focused or something like this. Well, maybe this is true, but then those other scientists could never exist. So I still feel that in the end, it's just a matter, you need to feel like this is your life and you want to spend your life in this way. And that's it. And it's when you find it worthwhile, you don't find it worthwhile. Adina? The problem with this career stuff is that someone uh, will suffer because of this. Like for example, if you have kids and you still continue traveling, it's not exactly the same like if you are at home with your kids. <laughs> Like me, I stopped chess even. I was 23-30 rating when I had my son. For, yeah. Because <laughs> simply, I, I just cannot leave him all the time with someone and to win what? The prices that are in female chess? That if you are not in top 20, you don't win anything almost? So... Yeah, I mean, I understand. I mean, I understand all kinds of challenges, but let's be honest, they're still, as I said, Kostinyuk also had a child and became world champion. And I'm not saying we all should be costing you, right? I'm, I'm just saying that things are always possible, but yeah, also... She didn't, uh, she didn't really take care of her daughter. By the way, the guardian of her daughter is uh, her yeah. ex-husband, you know. I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm not saying... I'm not... In her career, but... Uh, I, I'm not saying... One more time. I'm, I'm not judging, right? Not at all. Not in, and not in the way that you should do it or shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that it's always about choices. I mean, Kortnoy, he went in, in Assal and left his family behind. And I'm not saying this is, I mean, that's the way how he escaped uh, the Soviet Union, right? Because he did that, because he, the only way he could do it is leave his family behind. That's also the reason why the regime was thinking he couldn't do it. But he said, I want to become a chess player. I want to play abroad. And that's the only way how I can do it. And then later on, I will see what I can do for my family. And I'm just not saying all these kind of things is that, um, as I said, I'm not giving you a solution for doing something or not doing something, right? I'm just saying that we always make choices. And what I love about chess is that we make those choices uh, consciously. And in some way, we always take responsibility, whatever, uh, whatever decision we made. I mean, let's be honest. I also, I'm not grandmaster, although I could. And I should have probably taken a lot of decisions differently if I should have. Right, and I haven't. So, as consequence, I'm a master, and that's it. I can make a nice story, but that's it. So, um, what I find most important is that everybody needs to feel at some point that you feel comfortable with the choices you made and and just accept them and don't make excuses about it. That's my main point. And what I feel like chess is offering us. Uh, chess is teaching us that we take decisions and we take the consequences no matter what. And let's be honest, we would wish that a lot of more politicians would think in such a way. 
I mean, the world would be much better place if all the politicians take the full responsibility of the choices they make. And so in some way, we would like that all the politicians would play chess much more and they would be treated much more like politicians, uh, like chess players, right? And so, but it's not the case. So what we can do, and that's a little bit like also how, how I feel very much to variety is that we want the children to learn them good values. We want to learn them all these kind of good futures. And that's what we can do. We cannot change the world, it's too big. I, at least I can't. And I think that most of us think in the same way. Uh, we can't maybe, well, even in some way, maybe we could have taken decisions differently. Like, well, I mean, I didn't you also have a full drive with all kinds of decisions, right? And then also you can say, I could have done this or I could have done that. And then maybe things were different. Okay, maybe it could be, right? But we took the decision we took. Uh, and now we're just where we are and we can just move forward from where we are standing now. And from where we're standing now, we can maybe be an inspiration. Maybe we couldn't manage it in behavior, but maybe we couldn't uh, show it in actions, but at least we can show our experience and then tell them the direction where to go to. As I said, I mean, very often, and, and again, I come to the same point. I know that I can't show everything in actions because I'm not a grandmaster, for example. So at the point I said to uh, very talented students, I say, I can bring you there, but it's a little bit like, um, in, 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 like in the Bible, right? I can show you the direction where's the promising land, but I can't bring you there because I've never been there, right? So that's also, and I understand that this may be not, not so powerful as I could be doing it, but that's it. I can only be who I am. This is what I am. This is what I can do. And the rest is up to you or up to others. Uh, please search somebody else, a new sensei or a new master who can teach you uh, what will be there, right? And I think this is very important. So you limit yourself to where you can be, where you are. I will never pretend what I'm not. Um, and then from there on, I think that if you want to be uh, well better than me or stronger than me, then go to persons who manage that part, right? And I can bring you here. And I think that's also very important for each of you is it doesn't matter what kind of context you're teaching, always stay very close to yourself, be loyal to yourself and appreciate yourself for all the efforts you made in your life and everything what you managed to do. And give this as a present to the others. And if they outperform you at some point, then just say, you're always welcome for a cup of talk, coffee or tea and, and we have some nice chat, but that's it, right? For me, now it yeah. stops there. And I think that's so important that you're uh, accepting yourself in this fullness and don't blame yourself for what you could have been. Because we know from this behavior point, which we discussed before, it, it, it will not last. Yeah. If you pretend who you're not, it will, can maybe last one week, maybe one month, but that's it, right? At some point, the children see different behavior from who you are and it's not working. And then the only thing what we ha happened is that all the good things you built, you kind of destroyed, your, you, will, you will destroy for yourself. And I'm still happy that all my top grandmas with 2650, they're still happy to come here or to call me and, and to chat with me. And they, they, they think in a good way about the training and they will never blame me for why you're not stronger or why you're not the grandmaster, right? They think about, okay, you, you walked with me along the way till you could. And then I took another uh, grandmasters or other persons to bring me to the next steps. And I think that's the point. So it doesn't matter if you're a trainer up to 1,000, up to 1,500, up to 2,000, or up to 2,500. In the end, you should just play your role along the line. And when it's time to let them go and to go to the next phase, wish them all the best of luck. Always ask them that you're always happy to hear from them. But that's it. And don't see yourself as less because you're only to this part or that part or that part. You always will do only some part. And that's, I think it's also very, um, yeah, important. About this point, are there any questions or remarks or something you wish to share? Um, then let's go through a little bit theory, attempt number two. Uh, so um, the teacher, as you can see, there are always four steps 
And always keep in mind that whatever you're teaching, there are always four steps. And we always want to let them go through all these phases. The first one is I instruct and I give an example. Well, we talked a lot about it today, right? So the teacher is simply showing a skill or saying the definition. So don't start lessons with uh, what are we teaching or learning today? Or uh, uh, what is this or what is that? In general, the idea is that you give the definition yourself and after you ask them to repeat it, right? That's the direct instruction. And this is very strong. And chess is very suitable for this direct instruction. Why? Because we have very concrete knowledge we want to share. Like I said, in a, an example of mate, uh, with mate with Rook and King, I didn't ask you questions. Um, I was saying, this is this, and then we moved on, right? This is the hamburger. This is the way how we conjugate it. This is how we call these things. So you just copy the instruction and then you do it together. What is happening after is that the children are executing the instruction. You have a point of five uh, set of questions and they're just following one, two, three, four, five. You got the result. I can check it one more time. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, I did everything. I understand what I've done, right? So this is very important. So each lesson you're giving always use this kind of structure. First, write them your instructions on the paper. Then you give this paper to the student. The student goes through the exercises and needs to be uh, able to solve any puzzle following this instruction. Then they are doing it together. And then in the end, they do it individually because in the end, they are the boss, they are the owner of the learning process. The teacher is small, modest, and sitting in the end, just uh, looking at his result. It's a little bit like clockwork, right? His work is done. You're finished. You have your, actually, after making your instruction, the rest is actually clockwork. You just follow the process till the moment the student are capable of uh, saying the terms or saying the concepts or being capable of executing the skill. And in my opinion, this is so vital. This is a very simple picture, but in my opinion, this is one of the key things of all the learning. Your work is always in, in front of the lesson where you make the instruction. And then this instruction you will follow till the end. If we see another picture, uh, which is actually based on it, it's, uh, it's actually an explicit direct instruction. This is more or less how lessons can be perceived and also built. So what do we do is that we, we are reading it like this, right? So this is the main part of the lesson. And this is, let's say the extra part for the smart kids or when they want uh, a more, um, uh, well, comprehensive and, and, and more extended learning. So then beginning, of course, it's very important to tell what they are learning. Uh, so what are the terms? And this is always phrased in the, in the way of I can. So you always phrase what they learn in I can after this lesson, I can formulate a plan or I can get deliver made with a rook and king. Um, you check if all the knowledge uh, which is needed in order to uh, well learn the lesson that the, those uh, knowledge is uh, available and that the, that knowledge is active, right? So for example, chaser, guard and helping piece, those things were concepts which they need to know if they want to deliver mate with rook and king or queen and rook king right so you need to understand how your lesson is built up on previous lessons and which knowledge is required which prior knowledge is required in order to, to get the lesson in a good way along the way we check uh, always the understanding um, then you do the presentation where you explain the concept or you explain the skill and again, along the way, you check if the skill is, uh, if you're capable. We did it a little bit before. Remember, I was explaining the theory about the hamburger. Then we did the exercises. And I was checking if each of you are capable of repeating it. Very important is that each of the students need to get their turn. So you understand if each of the students comes along with the knowledge. Not a single one normally escapes this. In my opinion, that's really my... Uh, effort I always try to make that each of the student is safe and each of the student will join uh, 
the knowledge at least the the basic you get you get this guided practice like we said before uh, uh, then of course you you try to say uh, the outcome of the lesson what you want to take from it and you make a closure are there any questions about this part or is it more or less clear oh clear so what happens so let's make it now in practice so how normally and this is also one example on how you do it in online lesson so i am asking um tatiana we'll start what is the best takeaway what you take from all these webinars so far uh can you please tell this point and then give the turn to the next one yes um i think i i appreciate the most or like this um well the direct exchange like asking questions and getting a an answer and the best practice examples the exchange of those um uh, you mean you mean the explicit direct instruction that part yeah mm -hmm. that yeah part. Mm -hmm. okay thank you very much uh, you can give the turn to somebody else. I have Adina's picture next, so Adina. <laughs> uh, for me, something very precise. Uh, the thing uh, with the coordinates on leeches that I didn't know about it. I'm actually using leeches, but for other things. And the one uh, with uh, giving puzzles by teams, I didn't know we can tick and choose the teams, you know, on chess.com. I didn't yeah. know. This. I'm using it for me, actually. I'm training myself also. <laughs> very good very good my rating in puzzle is more than three thousand. what is your rating <laughs> well, <laughs> they see ah well done and then they don't do but i am still trying <laughs> well this i mean this is perfect right what you're doing is again uh, you're motivating yourself to show an example right this is also something i say every rule i give in chess i always try to apply it in my own chess games because i felt if i'm not doing it in my own chess game or i can't then why I am giving this rule to my students, right? That's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Very Actually, good. I started playing the French. I am teaching them the French opening with black. I started playing it online to see myself. How is it? Because I never played it before. Yeah. I started, yeah, I like it <laughs> myself. <laughs> no, but this is very good. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Okay, please, next time. Uh, next turn, please. Adina, you can give the turn to somebody else. Valentina? Uh, I didn't know, and I like the the hamburger method. Uh, I didn't know it is named like this. Actually, I invented it myself. So the, if you will find any literature, there won't be, right? It's just something I was... <laughs> okay. Yeah. And also in uh, chess.com, I didn't know uh, about the uh, themes uh, puzzles. I used oh. to do some on chess, chess tempo, but mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know about chess.com or leeches, these puzzles. Okay. Thank you. You can give the turn. Uh, variety. Um, I think one of my big takeaways actually is the vocabulary that you were using, showing us with the rook and the king mate. I mean, obviously I teach that in my way, but I rather like your way of, um, if you like, it's a good way for the children to remember just those key words and then uh, fi finding mate, but getting them familiar with, you know, the waiting move the chaser, the hound. I like that and I will use that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Monica? Hi. Yes, I, I haven't heard about this hamburger method, so I missed the beginnings. I'm really eager to watch the video back and learn a bit yeah. more about it. The hamburger, just to show you, was the, the concept where... Um, Is this the where the black king is in between the rook and the king? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the position of the king, and we we went through all the way. Like here, you see also the black king is in the in the middle of uh, the king and the rook. 
And what is very good is that you use the, the pieces separately uh, in and, and understanding the function. The rook is kind of cutting off the king while this one is uh, controlling the squares. So this one is the guard and this is also guarding, but also chasing. And that's where the terms uh, right also was mentioning. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was the Hamburg. Um, Alice. Yes. Yes, I was really um, feeling appreciated for a lot of teaching tactics and also, especially the hamburger as well. And I used the chat GPT to dig a little bit more and what are those, the other similar teaching techniques and it gave me a bunch of that and I really feel thankful for that. And I also noticed that there is actually a new way of, for myself to learn um, strategies using the, the especially online techniques <laughs> like chess.com or Ch Lee Chess. Oh. I also never thought about that. Okay. And to, to point out um, the most important part was that the YouTuber, the Gotham Chess, I, I haven't thought about from the other angle where the students come up because in China, we have the sort to say gray wall. So yeah. we the students couldn't actually get on YouTube and watch those. So it's kind of nice from one hand. The other hand is they actually will eventually develop those and we know as a teacher how to encounter and dealing with the situation. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You can give the turn to somebody. Yes. Be careful you're okay. muted. Okay. Uh Susanna. I'm not sure if she's still Let's in see. the classroom. Susanna's there. Okay, maybe I take okay. yeah. uh, <laughs> ah, yeah. Isn't ah. Susan and me you are yes. requesting? Yes, yeah, we are requesting if you what is your summary point, right? What you like to share with us, what you took from the seminar or just well I think um all of the girls uh, have said a lot. I just want to thank you um for that and uh because it's a new approach and new visions for us i think this is a plus and i really enjoy being all together mm -hmm. um unfortunately i had mistake with the hours so i came in a bit a little bit late because it was on portugal uh, schedule I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> no worries. But I hope... well, like I said, a little bit late, but never too late, right? Yes. So That's... I would appreciate if you could um, share with us. Don't know if you record it. And yeah, yes, share... it will be recorded and everything will be visible. And also the PowerPoint will be shared. Yes. Well, that would be fantastic for me because I could uh, review the first part. Um, and thank you. I hope there is more um, uh, uh, and you, you do more uh, trainings for us. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. The kind words. Uh, Eva, uh, we still have. Um, yes, uh, those little games uh, with the coins was uh, were something new for me and I liked it. And um, about... Uh, in the first part, you spoke about uh, how the pieces are feeling. For example, the queen or the other. I used it. Uh, I use uh, this thing, but uh, I never thought about uh, use it in the uh, first, in the uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, what else? On chess.com, I didn't know about um, uh, the puzzles that uh, you can. Uh, uh, you can uh, make the value of yeah, uh, yeah the rating is quite one. important and what they do normally is if they if they are successful or the things are too easy you go 100 points up if something tough you go 50 points down right mm -hmm. and in this way some topics you can have on a higher level and others maybe on a lower level so you just start somewhere 
then you make them, if you're successful, you find them too easy, you just add a little bit of points. And if you find them too difficult, you just go lower, right? So it's a little bit like a very dynamic system, which you can apply to any topic or team. Yes, I like that part also that uh, uh, if uh, you are just learning, then you use only one topic. And uh, uh, when you already know, you can use uh, more topics. Um, and um, uh, I know about uh, leeches and uh, that coordinates uh, part, but uh, uh, I uh, didn't really use it, but probably I will because... Uh, uh, I have some problems with my uh, students that uh, uh, when uh, we are playing some um, some games and I am telling one move and they are looking the other part of the of the chess uh, yeah. chess table and it's it's uh, annoying for me. <laughs> so yeah. probably I should I should use uh, that lead chess uh, part. Yeah, I think it's just a playful part, right? Which you can use for a certain time uh, uh, and then. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. So let's let us revise. So, what is this kind of? Um, uh, what do you think about this reflection part? Because one of the parts of the, this webinar was also about reflection. So, what did I do with this kind of exercises of making the summary together? Um, Valentina, what do you think? To rememorize all the things we spoke about and to um to understand maybe better not better but uh, talking them again and again uh, to stay there <laughs> something like that but i mean for who is this more interesting or for whom is it interesting in which way this summary Because we made a summary together, right? And you were mentioning all these points. So how this can be interesting for a teacher and how this can be interesting for other students? Like we can add this part in our teaching process, like asking students what, what they um, understood, what, what they liked and uh, getting feedback from them, I think yes. is. Exactly, so the point is I'm checking if all the knowledge is there, right? I, because yeah, I can yeah. assume that everybody understood it, but you see already to the summary, you were repeating some of the stuff, but I also noticed that some of the stuff you haven't noticed it at all, none of you. So it's quite interesting. I mean, the Hamburg everybody remembers, so for sure <laughs> this part was clear. Uh, but you notice, for example, I was talking about strategy and tactic and a little bit about the calculation. No, nobody mentioned it even for uh, one word. And of course, this is also telling. So probably this part was uh, complicated without the examples and the hamburger I did with an example. So also sometimes you have time for it. Sometimes you don't have time to it. But again, you see it also as a feedback for a trainer. You see that if you give an example and you go through it and you check it together, the knowledge remains. If I say, but I told you last time about this positional strategy, and then you're saying you're blaming maybe your student for not knowing or remembering, but you see that actually I didn't give you an example. And again, what we were saying all the webinar long, if you don't give an example and show it in actions, nothing is remembered. Of course, sometimes we can't always do it. We do everything in an example, but you see exactly how clear these things are. Everybody remembers the hamburger because we had an example and we had an action. Nobody remembers this theoretical stuff because we didn't do anything with it. Now, of course, this was also not part of this uh, webinar. So for me, it was not important, but it's always something to remember for yourself. Also as a feedback, as a trainer, what should remember, what not, right? You wanted to say something. Yeah, I mean, you make uh, you make some really good points in in that. As as, as and, and we have to self reflect on our uh, methods of training. And I think one of the, the reasons we remember the hamburger so well is it's like it's but like a buzzword. We're visualizing a hamburger, so we're seeing the kings on either side with the filling. We're visualizing that, and it's a lovely buzzword. We're not going to forget the word hamburger because we're here in a chess training session we've got lots of chess vocabulary but one hamburger and I think I find that in school as well is that 
uh, you can teach them how to checkmate with the rooks. But if you call it the lawn mower and you tell them you're mowing the lawn in those nice stripes, if in a future lesson you say, who can show me the lawn mower, suddenly they're, 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 they're there. Or they'll bring me over to their game saying I've used the lawn mower. So it's these clever words that perhaps uh, are buzzwords that help uh, us. And I think you're right, actually, we've, as, as a group of trainers, We've remembered the hamburger. Um, yeah. <clears throat> there's so, been a lot of really good content, but we've remembered the hamburger. <laughs> yeah. So what is the good thing and the bad thing about buzzwords? Can we also that summarize now together? Monica, what do you think? What's the good and the bad thing about buzzwords? The good thing is you remember it more easily. And the bad thing is maybe you don't remember the correct terminology. So, so Well, that's one thing. So you see that maybe you remember the Hamburg, we had no clue anymore. What was the hamburger? You just remember there was Hamburg in this weather. <laughs> no clue anymore what about it, right? So that's that's one thing. Yeah, if you don't repeat the action, then it's just the concept uh, which remains uh, because we know the hamburger from all our nice meals, right? Uh, so, or something like this. It's, so that sticks to mind. But also keep in mind that if you have a very strong buzzword, you see that all the other vital knowledge, which you maybe, maybe I find the hamburger was just a small word, which I find not that important in this whole lesson. And I think the outcome is that everybody remembers this small word, which actually I didn't want to stress at all. Then did I succeed in my lesson or not? In one hand, yes, because I mean, everybody's involved, everybody will remember the webinar. And if that's a kind of motivation for you to go through and see it one more time and maybe take all the other uh, interesting technical parts, yes, then I did my job uh, well. But if that's the point, right, you only remember this part and actually not all the other theoretical parts which I was saying how to develop yourself as a trainer, how the, to follow the steps as, uh, from the children in the order. Then, then, of course, the buzzword is only kind of disturbing uh, the lesson. And that's also something to keep in mind. So buzzword, because I know, for example, a lot of trainers use a lot of vocabulary for mating patterns, uh, like Anastasia mate and, and so on. Uh, but the difficulty is that all these words kind of uh, refrain yourself from learning the basic concept of chaser, guard, and helping pitch, which you need for every mating position. So you give, I, if I give you one boss mating pattern, you remember one boss mating pattern. If I teach you uh, helping piece, chaser and guard, I teach you all the mating patterns and how you can build them. And so you always need to keep in mind that fancy words, yes, in one way you can do it from time to time, but don't use it too often because it normally uh, gives the wrong emphasizes and uh, importance or priority on, on the terms you want them to remember. Pluses and minuses. And that's also why teaching is never straight away. That's why you never stop learning because in this aspect, well, there's always something to be learned or maybe to make a different accent. Normally what is important with these kind of things is if I repeat my important things every single lesson, I don't mind when the buzzword from today was hamburger because if I you don't remember today, I will repeat it next week or the next time, and then after some time, you will all be able to uh, remember the important knowledge as well, right? But the main point is always keep in mind that the power of these buzzwords. To be honest, for example, I never knew it was a buzzword, but I love the word, so I my hamburger is the buzzword, right? So now I know that this is a buzzword. No, very nice. By the way, Magda, are you also with us? Um, Yes, I'm here. Could you also tell you what is your takeaway from today, from so far? What is uh, maybe the most important thing you take from this webinar where you feel like, or you want to share with us? Uh, it's common, but I like uh, I like it uh, burger uh, for me. And yeah. also I like the game with uh, the pawns and the kings. Um, and the other example with many pieces where they can't uh, capture it. Because I think that it's important for kids to understand the space, the pieces, the moves, everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing. So um, 
this kind of summary, I always advise you to incline it in whatever lesson you do, online especially, because in online, it's very difficult to create some interaction, right? So this is one of the nicest forms to see if everybody's not sleeping and everybody's involved. When I have normally a lesson, I do this every 20 minutes. Just for a reminder for myself that I will never do a stat which is not along with all my students. So I know along the way, that everybody's involved. And also what's very good, I see what you repeat and what you can't repeat or the emphasizes. The repeating stuff is always in a very natural way, in a very communicative way. I can also see how the dynamics are in the group. Who gives the turn to whom, for example. Also, especially when you're working a lot in groups in, in school classes of 20 kids, you see who's friends with whom and you want to figure out in the beginning of the year, just let them do this exercise and let them choose and you see automatically their favor, right, or the favorite person or something like this. So also, this is, gives you some information. You can also see the persons who are more creative. Some people repeat, other persons find something different. Uh, uh, for example, Eva, for example, said very different things in very uh, different aspects, for example. So also it's quite interesting is that when you give this kind of summary and you make it with all the students and you see that together, you, you notice a lot of points, right? Mm -hmm. So also for students, it can be, ah, the other students were thinking about this point. I haven't thought about it or I forgot a little bit about it. Good point, right? So it's also interesting to see how other students are learning. So. This, this kind of summary, in my opinion, is very good for the teacher to understand what remained or what is the main focus, um, what I want to or I need to repeat the next time. Um, and I think it's a very entertaining because everybody feels appreciated also. Everybody can say whatever they wanted to say. There's no good, there's no wrong. It's just like what you want to share. This is also the wording I use very often. What would you like to share with us? What would you like to take from uh, these lessons or this workshop, right? And that's also something I always feel that to, to build a little bit this uh, group uh, feeling is also something very important. So for me, this kind of summary together, yes, it takes time, but in my opinion, that's, that's always very uh, well spent time together. Um, what is maybe also important before I forget is that we have this kind of game, right? Um, this game uh, with uh, four to four uh, square. What is also important is that you can play it on any level. We had it about diversification, but I mean, uh, well, I think that Adina is probably one of the strongest players also in this group. But Adina, if you think that we play this kind of game, could it be interesting? <laughs> but I, I can move the king diagonally, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah, I mean, the king goes like a normal king, right? So we can't capture each other, but we play this game. So, but if we play this game, what will happen? Most likely. But uh, this one is who plays first uh, will win. Yeah, you know? but the point is you will start thinking, you will not make any move until you, and you calculated that you have the winning route, right? I mean, you will calculate this position and visualize every single move. You, I mean, kids will play just any move and then they will see the result. If we are playing and we are on a higher level, we will not play anymore. We will calculate the whole position and then you will say who will win. And if I say, well, I make it more complicated because this is, let's say, five points. And let's say this is, uh, I don't know, it's not working. So this is three and this is five. So now already it becomes more, now you can't calculate it so easily anymore who will win, right? Depending on the, the colors and the points. So the point is that this kind of game, you can play on any level. The only difference is that on the, the lowest level, you just kids are taking and just calculating. And when the stronger players are doing, they are visualizing the moves. They start calculating the moves and it will be in calculation exercise. So the good thing and the interesting thing is that the diversification can be very easily made because even on the top level, you can play this game. If Carlson is playing this game against, I don't know, uh, uh, Nakamura, it can be also interesting, but they will they only will be sitting silent and they will calculate <laughs> till the end, right? To figure out. And of course, I mean, if it's really too boring and there's nothing, we can always increase the board to six to six and then it becomes interesting, right? We don't have to stick to the four to four board. And you understand 
whatever happens, you can just extend it and very easily you have a new game. What I find quite interesting also is that, for example, I call it the gladiator game, is that I replace one king for a rook. Who will win the game, uh, do we think? Eva, what do you think? If I replace, for example, uh, you have this class. And one, uh, let's say, imagine that everything is just one point. Let's make it easy, right? So everything is one point. And I replace one king for a rook. Who will win? Not sure if I understand well, but uh, even okay, if this, it... The, the white king, I replace it for a white rook. And the king yes. is the rook. So who will, be, who will collect the most pawns? The king or the rook? Mm. And remember, the king can never capture the rook, and the rook can never capture the king, right? Or you will say difficult to assess well, i mean the rook uh, can move only one it's almost the, king, the same and, and the king too right so only <laughs> yes. when, when the, only when there are some pawns captured the rook can do more most of course yes just that the king can move uh, in diagonal Can anybody tell me with a little bit maybe more uh, security what will be the result? Mm. Who will outperform whom? Magda, please. Uh, the rook uh, will have the um, every square under control. But the, I mean, the rook, I mean, the rook can take pawns, right? Just like a normal game. Yes, but uh, the king can take the pawn uh, behind the rook. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the rook can never take the king, right? Check doesn't exist. He can't uh, control everything. Like so the what, real rook. So who will win? I mean, what's your, what, what would you say? Um, I think it's the same, maybe. Same, okay. Anybody another opinion? Thank you. I would say the king. King. What do we think? Uh, who do we think uh, from the uh, let's say the the students? Which piece will they take? Because if I play this game with my students and I always ask, which color do you want? Which color do you think they take? The rook or the king? The rook. They will say the rook, 100%. And of course, the king will win easily because I will yes. just put my king next to the rook and you will never pass by, right? I can take everything upon and then I block. I take a pawn and I block. I mean, the king can just stay in the middle and I just block you and eat everything. And then only in the end, maybe the rook can be taking a little bit one or two more, but then it's already too late. You already took more than seven coins. So it's a very easy game. The king will win uh, by, by far. So what is interesting, again, with this kind of game is that you see that the do first certification is very easy. You can, like the Romans, you can see which piece is stronger, how they can perform or how they can't perform, how they work. And again, you see, you can do it on a high level because or something like this, it doesn't exist, of course, in a child's mind. That's only the stronger players can think about such kind of thing. Abstraction is also something only stronger players know, right? So you can see that some children maybe have this by nature, uh, they understand it, but sometimes you can also figure out, right? And, and, and see it as part of the adventure of uh, the exploring part. Um, another point, which is maybe also important is that, um, uh, is that, for example, we had a discussion between a little bit the girls who wanted not to be that competitive to the, to the boys, right? So I know that in a lot of girls, they don't like comp competitions in the beginning, maybe later on. So what I do is that you can also do this game together. How, in how little moves you can capture all the pawns. Uh, and so, for example, that's not that exciting. But if I make it different, then I can, for example, you need to collect 13 points and these are, let's say, two, and I can make them. And you have to take a number like 15, or you have to take a number like 17. So they need to co co collaborate together and get exactly the amount of, the, uh, of a certain number. 
So again, the task becomes different before in, 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 and instead of being competitive, you need to collaborate and you need to calculate together in order to get the result. Let's think about the future, right? If you work in a profession and you want to work in a team. So there's a lot of skills where I, I can do almost anything I want didactically uh, as an, an, in this kind of game. All the skills I want to, uh, how to say, to uh, develop in the child, I can do it with this game. And that's the cool thing, that you can work with the coins, you can work them together, you can make it competitive, you, you, there are so many. And remember that I have, even I call it a hippodrome. Um, a hippodrome is, uh, I have a youth field and actually it's even larger. It's something I think 12 to eight. And uh, I can probably take it. Unfortunately, I can't find it anymore. It was like a big one, big, big one field. So as you can see, it's one of them, but it was half. And it was about the hippodrome because I played with knights. And you have all kinds of blocks. So imagine that this is a part where you start with knights. And I can even make on the task, if in, especially when you're working in schools, on each square, you can even make a task. So for example, I'm, I'm, I have this kind of, uh, you have the board, right? So imagine that I make a new board. Uh, I make it empty. I imagine I go here and then other knight is here. So we have these knights. So I can make a mark all kinds of squares with an A square can be a task. If I'm, if I'm a general teacher, I can make drawing and here I can do some math and here I can do some language, right? I can make all mark the squares. I can mark them like they need to collect coins. I need to do it, let's say you only have, or history, you only can take the years where something happened in a certain time. I can do it with places like uh, all the places in Romania, uh, or cities in Romania, you can only step on those squares and not the other ones, right? I can do anything I want with geography, with history, with uh, whatever I want to do, or I can make like a notes or a mate in one. So I can make this full with mate in one puzzles. I don't remember who was saying it. And you need to step on the, on the square, then you need to turn it around and let's say, and you do it again, you can do it competitive or not. You can say you can solve it and then you can keep the card or you can solve it in 10 seconds and then you can keep the card, right? Again, you have all the options again, how to, to twist it to how you want to do it. And again, as you can see, these options are enormous. There's nothing you can't do with the chessboard. That's the cool thing. And this is an A to A board, but I remember that the Hippodrome, I need to ask Regina how, um, I will try to make some screenshots and, and send them so you have it visually for you. But the main point is that you need to understand that since the chessboard is such a nice uh, geographically uh, spatial uh, board, you can do whatever you want. You just write down a pass, a puzzle, uh, whatever you want to do, and then you can solve it. You can do it in teams, right? You, as a team, you need to solve a little bit like a mini puzzle. Even uh, Dina, if you want to work with 1,200 to 1,500 and you want to let them work in teams, you can make some kind of um, a mini, a mini plans or something like or puzzles like uh, they need to solve, right? And then in the end, uh, they need to solve it as a team or individual. Uh, and then if you solve it correctly, you can keep the card. I think these games, there are on chess tutor also, no? I saw some games with coins. Yeah, the, the coins are also partially on, on the chess tutor, but actually these are much more expanded because the, the chess tutor have it in a very small way. What I'm saying is that if you understand the elements of what makes an exercise is more difficult and easier, you can adjust it to anything you want for any student you have. And that's the cool thing because you can really tailor-made it to the level of the student. 
Uh, and that, but to, to be honest, this is one of really of one of my favorite because uh, it's, I mean, also when I play this with students, I can easily let them win and I can easily crush them, right? I mean, it's very easy to do both. So if, uh, if somebody is really, how to say, a little bit uh, over self-confident uh, in, in the way that he, uh, then you can, all, of course, easily win it. And then you say, well, we have still something to learn. If you want them to build confidence, you can let them win, right? It's very easy to, to do both. Uh, you can also let them go back. Uh, this was also one of the questions was about uh, result thinking. So let let us stop. So th this is what let's well, let's say about the uh, the working forms, right? Uh, and the way how you can diversify when it comes to result, um, and especially this is with high gifted kids. It happens very often that they only care about result and nothing else, right? We experience the same, or so. What is very often with what you do is normally I you play uh, exercises and I turn the board. So sometimes they they are solving something, and normally what happens with high gifted kids is they um, they focus on the result, and if they can't solve it, then the exercise is stupid, and there's nothing in between. So the exercise is either stupid or it's too easy, and there's nothing in between. And you think, okay, well maybe there's something in between. No, there's not. So what you do is you play with elements. So you say, I'm playing a game, then I'm a little bit better, then I turn the board and said, you can deliver me mate in one. Ah, how? Or mate in a couple of moves, right? Or which move do you do? Then they solved it. Then you turn the board again. Then you play a little bit again. You give another task. Then you solve it. Then you turn the board again. So what happens is that the whole idea of one game with one result is gone. And when the result is gone, then there's no perfectionism anymore. Like I need to win a game or I lost the game. No, we played tens of games and we twisted all kinds of elements. So there's they, they cannot frame it anymore in the result like I won or I lost. So I solved a lot of things, right? And that's what you want to break. You want to break down their understanding. There's only winning and losing, but there's just a lot of things to learn. And the more we, you play with the elements, you break more or less their concept of that is black or white and there's nothing in between. And what I do as a teacher is I just want to tear down their wall of black and white. And that's the only thing what I'm doing. So I just give them so many tasks and I twist so many times. And I, for example, I put a position and then I take away their queen. And I said, uh, we are playing this game. And they say, but it's not fair. Where's my queen? I said, well, you blundered it. No, it's not possible. I didn't blunder my queen. Oh, okay, I will put it on the board. Again, I just try to twist it so that they are attentive. Then they are already involved, right? Because, because they think it's unfair, immediately they, the exercise become interesting because they fought already for the exercises. They wanted the queen to solve it. So automatically, they don't think about the exercise anymore because they already in the exercise because they wanted something. So you just need to play with them a little bit and play with the elements. And the more you play with the elements, you break down that it's only about the result and about winning and losing. And that's a little bit all about this kind of exercises. So the last part of this webinar, what I want you to show is that if you are learning what you want to achieve with the children, what you want to in the big picture, right? And I want this, for example, with them, who have a result thinking, I want them to be more flexible, growth mentally. We figure fixed mindset is not bad, right? To play for result, it can be very motivational. I really wanted to go to the world championships again. And I was uh, doing a lot of work because I really wanted to go again, because this experience to go to the world championships was so amazing that I really wanted to work four or five hours a day. So there's nothing wrong with a fixed mindset from time to time, but Along the way, you need to let it go and to learn the process and learn the way. Uh, uh, yeah, you, uh, how to make progress in your chess and in your play, right? And so this part, uh, when you, especially when you're learning with kids, try to play with the elements. And very often, it's quite interesting is that most of these games, you think that it all came from my mind. Well, I have to be honest, I'm quite creative anyway, but most of the games, they were also the children told me things and I was thinking, ah, this is what they find interesting. And then I changed it, right? This boy who was on the ground, I invented instantly that I will make his exercise to see if it happens or if it makes something work. 
So it's also, it's a little bit like you always have this interaction because in the end, uh, learning is always about relationship. Children in general, they are not interested in chess in itself. It's a little bit like variety also was saying, it's about for the teacher very often. You need to be there for them and you, they need to be able to work for you. They need to find that interesting, that the, this mutual respect. And that's something always keep in mind that uh, in the first place, it's always about building a relationship. Teaching is about building a relationship in the first place. And after it's a little bit like when you build this bridge, because I mean, you're both, and let's say, and an, an, let's say, and an, an, an house, right? Or a castle, a tower. And you need to build this bridge so that uh, there comes something from one side to the other side. And that only can be delivered when there's a connection. And when this connection is broken, there's no learning anymore, which also means that if at some point there's some violence in the rules, like somebody is not uh, obeying the rules or is kind of uh, obstructing, I always stop uh, because I know there's no learning taking place. So what I do normally is I stop the lesson in the way that I'm giving them something to do, each child. And then I go to the child who is obstructing and I'm saying, what's happening here? Because I need to restore that, uh, that, that relationship. Because if the relationship is not restored, there will not be any learning anymore for the child, which means that I either need to say, I'm sorry, we can't be in the same class, but that's the last thing I want to do. And I think that the last thing I sent somebody out of the class was probably more than 10 years ago. And that, because that's and that was actually in favor of him. He asked me, can I go out of sight of the class? Because he... Uh, um, he has HD, uh, ADHD, so sometimes he just needed some uh, me time. We just said, okay, that's fine. Just take your time and then you can come back. But in general, I always think that's the, the thing, right? You need to build the relationship and from the relationship, you move on together because in the end, you're just a tool or a translator of how they can learn. It's... Um, can I ask about something? Sorry, yeah, please. Yeah. Problem is uh, that they like me, that they don't like chess. And they stick with me because they like to spend time with me. Some in schools, like two, three years, yeah. they keep going to chess yeah. club. But I see, I can see that they're not really interested in chess. Yeah. And then, and then, and then, and that's at some point, I, I'm telling that I don't mind when you're in there. But at some point, I also feel like if you really don't like chess, I mean, you're, I mean, Either we spend some time just outside of the class, which is also fine, or if that's not possible, then you say, "Okay, I'm sorry, but this is not this is not working, right?" Because uh, I mean, so for some time it's okay, but at some point you also need to be honest together because I think that's also part of a good relationship is that you're honest together, and then and and then also I'm I'm asking the child what exactly you think. I mean, as I said, for me everything is inside of chess. So if a child doesn't like chess, I mean, that's almost impossible because anything you want to learn in, in life, you can do with chess. So basically, I still feel we need to find somewhere where it, it could serve you because whatever you want to learn, I can do it with chess. Yeah, they like to play for fun, but they don't want to make the effort to really improve. I mean, they play okay, for fun. But I mean, but I mean, but then I'm asking, so what happens in all the other things in areas in your life? Is there some nothing really worth fighting for? No, I guess for school, they are all serious for school. Well, so, OK, so then, but I mean, I say that chess is more learning you than more than school. Then I will start like this. So if you think school is good, I think chess is much better because in, in school, you only can uh, skip one class in, 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 in chess. You can go to university level if you want. So chess is much more challenging than school, right? And um, I mean, and then and then we start fighting or discussing. I mean, fighting in a positive way, right? We start discussing about why not, why yes, and then I'm starting and then I'm giving my arguments and I said, okay, what are your what are your arguments, right? And I don't mind. For me, this is a little bit like exploring, and for me, it's everything is fine. If in the end I say, but chess is not for me, and I prefer whatever, and I said, well we are good friends. I mean, you always can come and say hi, but then, I mean, this is the class for chess, right? I mean, as I said, chess is not for everybody. As I said, uh, also with tic-tac-toe, this is like, if you want to play easy game, then play easy games. I mean, chess is a complex game. So uh, we have rules. 
Um, but I don't know if I answered your question. I mean, it's... Um, those no, I mean it was in some point that I really had to to kick out some students because I was feeling guilty for them registering all the time to the chess club. And I had to tell the parents I have no spots anymore, so they don't renew. Yeah. Because like they didn't really want to do chess for like two years, they didn't want to do. So yeah. <laughs> come on, I don't want to take your money. I don't care. Go <laughs> do something else. I, I was forced to tell them that I have no spots, something so just they just don't come. Yeah. I think and that's and I think that's also our responsibility. I think and that's and then I think you're serving a good deal with them. I mean, protect them in some way. I mean, and also that's also something I learned. I mean, in the before in the beginning, I was thinking every student I have, I need to keep them for life. That was uh, I mean, you feel like you have a connection with each of your students and you want to keep them all of them, and that's not working. That's you just have to accept that some students will leave you at some point and it doesn't mean that your relationship with them is over i had really very intensive good relationship with my students but at some point it didn't work out sometimes it was financially sometimes it was they were moving abroad sometimes the, there were other hobbies sometimes it was something in school and it doesn't matter it can just happen that somewhere along the line it doesn't fit anymore and you just have to let them go and that's part of life unfortunately and and I think that what you're saying is very good and very true, is that at some point you just need to tell the parents, I'm sorry, I think it's better uh, the child finds something different. I think we do uh, each other a favor. Either you change it. But for example, I mean, the boy also, I told also his mom, if he's behaving like this every single time, I'm I'm stopping the teaching. I mean, it's fine for one time. You can have a bad mood. You have again, a bad day, or even a bad period. But at some point, this needs to change. Now he changed for the better. Because we changed with Dasha, with his sister, and this was a very good uh, kind of game changer in the in the the whole thing. Because now he's fighting for his lesson, and he always asks for more. Because then his sister is turning and said, "Oh, but can I? Can't I have just more lessons? Right? Or I will work in the book." And I said, "Okay." <laughs> right? and then, so sometimes you need to also be a little bit creative in this aspect. But as I said, you can't save all of them. Sometimes it's just. Um, Okay, so one more, maybe one more last question. Uh, I know that some of you wrote uh, questions down. I think we covered a lot of them, but maybe there's one question somebody feels like. Uh, yeah, I feel to say something. Uh, I feel a great opportunity to ask because uh, I'm sure all of you are great players and teachers. Uh, and I would like to start teaching chess online also. But I don't really know what tools and the materials to use. I, I, I know about Chess Tutor, I know yeah. about chess.com and uh, uh, Lee Chess, but uh, I would like to know if there is a, a platform or I, I don't know uh, where I can find um, puzzles and things like this on te Teams uh, in a okay. border format. Yeah, I think I think I understand your question. The chess tutor, I would say you can share the screen, right? For example, with Zoom, you can share your screen and you can go yeah, through the chess yeah. tutor like it would be a normal step lesson, right? Yeah. So that's the easiest way. Um, what I showed you in Lead Chess and, and Chess.com are, in my opinion, the, my favorites when it comes to extra things next to the step method. Yeah. Um, uh, I also work, uh, especially this morning also, I work quite a lot just also with the books. Um, I let the, my students purchase them, them the books and we are just looking at the same screen or you can share the screen, whatever. I mean, you can choose, uh, but normally persons prefer to watch in, in the book, right? And then solve the puzzles and you can make the instructions together. In chess base, normally I display, but you can do also in lead chess if you want the free version for it. So in my opinion, you can just build along. And especially when you're in the beginning phase of your uh, trainer's career, I would always advise you just to take set and ready the step method because you don't need to think about it, right? Uh, so that I uh, take that as a foundation and then add up on, on the thing. But keep in mind that the step method covered all the topics. So be careful with, uh, let's say, adding a lot of uh, difficult strategy games or world champions and so on, because that's normally... Um, yeah, that's, we need to be modest because normally it's very difficult to conceptually to take those uh, games. 
Uh, and also keep in mind that everything what you're teaching, even if it's a game of uh, world champion or something, you need an instruction, right? Because it's one thing to explain something, and the other thing is to be able to do something. Mm -hmm. You saw it today. I was speaking about strategy, positional, and, and, and tactics. And you see that what re people remember was just a hamburger on the chessboard, right? So <laughs> keep that in mind. And that's not something about being a good or bad teacher. That's just how teaching works. We can't remember mm -hmm. everything in the same in, in one time. So that's also why we normally, especially the more abstract things, we do much later on in the phases. So really, I would advise you just stick to the basic things, keep things simple. Uh, work with the step books, work with the chess tutor, add something of the nice thing of chess.com or lead chess. And I think you already have a very great uh, yeah, lessons uh, which you can build. And if I want to have extra puzzles than chess tutor, for example, can I find, find some in other platform? Or? Yeah, I mean, the chess.com, right? In, in the topics. There you can choose mm -hmm. there. So what I normally do is in the chess tutor, I give the instruction, then I see if they can yes. understand it. And then I go to the random exercises on chess.com because the chess.com is nice for random exercises, which are a little bit mean and sometimes not on level, but that's fine for getting a little bit to the normal games where, well, the games can be mean as well. You can say mm -hmm. I have this level, but in the game you can get any puzzle you want, right? No matter what level you have. So I would say start with the books, Start with the chess tutor. And then if you feel like everybody is, is confident in this topic, double attack, eliminating defender, mm -hmm. pin, whatever, then you go to chess.com or you can do a little bit uh, the puzzle storm if you want a little bit more interaction. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you can do the puzzle rush without a survival mode and then you do it together, right? Which means that along the way, even if a topic is not covered, um, then you can give the instruction. But again, you only can do those things uh, after you taught the majority of the topics, because otherwise mm. there's simply no skill yet or no knowledge yet. Variety, I think you wanted to say something. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, just just in the subject of like online teaching, obviously uh, I hadn't had any experience of that until the COVID lockdown when uh, I got involved because there was no way we could do over the board chess. So well, I started teaching online chess. One of the things that I found the most useful in Lee chess, um, several things, it's just like in an over the board setting, the children want to play each other. Um, and uh, online chess has got so many wonderful tools like that. For example, in Lee chess, the puzzle races. So they get uh, I think it's one and a half minutes each. So they join a puzzle racer as a trainer. You can set up a puzzle racer and they each join it. They're having their own puzzles in that time. And they've got a little car on the screen. So as so we can all see these pink, blue, yellow, orange cars and their usernames. And those cars are racing across the screen, depending on how many puzzles they've solved in that time. And um, things like puzzle races, they love that because that's a bit of competition. They also understand that they're playing for their own personal best as well as racing each other. So they could be at different levels of development. And, and when we celebrate personal bests, even if that was the weakest score, we can be excited about that. And also as a trainer, you can set up little tournaments for the end of club time. So we can set aside 45 minutes for an arena tournament. Um, and if you've done that early on, you can then afterwards analyze some of the games that they've played and look at that together because you can share your screen. So I've, I've found that I online chess is actually a really powerful way of of teaching somehow more interactive than actually in the classroom I've enjoyed online chess so thank you okay I think we will round up here um what I would like to say is that I have a presentation uh, some of the things we covered some of the things we we discussed uh extra <laughs> And um, what, what, keep in mind that if you have any questions later on, um, it can be shortly after this webinar or it can be just any moment in time and you feel like I really want to answer this question and it was not covered yet, uh, just WhatsApp me. That's the easiest way to reach me out. Um, um, I think that you have my information. I have also my website, but I think that uh, probably I will ask Regina at least to give my um 
corresponds uh, details and just what's happening. That's normally the easiest way to uh, get an answer from me. Much better, much better than email. I'm not very much of an email person because I feel like it's uh, I get too many of them. So I just WhatsApp is just uh, very easy to um, to do so. Um, um, I respond normally quite promptly, so that's always um, good. Um, uh, Alice. Yeah, uh, I just think that I couldn't find your WhatsApp number. Is that inside the email? Because I, I just checked and I didn't see that within the email. Mm, what I can do is that- Or maybe okay. you can type in- Wait, wait, wait. I will ch type it now in the chat, but then you need to, um, yeah, you need to take it over because uh, this message will, of course, be- uh, so anybody, uh, maybe you can oh, uh, did I send everybody. No, wait, I didn't send everybody. Sorry. And I'm just wondering, are we forming up a WhatsApp group at the current stage for the training, or are we, or are you doing any other types of WhatsApp group? I'm not sure. I'm just asking. The point is that I don't feel it's my. Um, um, my position to create this WhatsApp group. If you think this is a great idea, I think it's a very great idea. But I know I know that you know who you need to approach for creating such kind of group, or you just need to say, we are not depending on any organization and we're just doing it ourselves. Because let's be honest, uh, I think in the end, if that's something I find also very important. We spoke about before about responsibility uh, before also with federations. Federations can do something for you or federations can't do something for you. At some point you need to say and you need to take your own career or your own right in your own hands. That's what chess players do. So if any federation or any organization is not doing what you want, then take it in your own hands. I think you're perfectly capable of creating a group. You just ask on anybody their telephone numbers you're adding everybody to one group and you just start. I can assure you that you, you can add me to this kind of group uh, and I can answer from time to time. I will not moderate it, of course, but I can just be on the sidelines and I'm more than happy to respond from time to time on questions. And I think it's a great idea that all the trainers are in one group because for pro promotional purposes, it's much easier. For a lot of uh, sharing information, it's so much easier. Uh, I have a lot of groups uh, in this way. And I, will, I also, I never feel the need to answer anything, but normally you do it because you like it. And I think that's also something with all these kind of groups. You can find it annoying or you can see it as just an interesting way to learn. For example, now, for example, yeah, I had this book, by the way, I saw it. It's like this book about Liu Sing, uh, Liu Wen Tse, or how you call this? Actually, I couldn't see it very clear. Maybe you could <laughs> type the name of the, now you, the now book. Now you can see it. Now you can see it, right? Liu Wen Tse, it's like here written. No, actually, I couldn't. <laughs> so probably it will be easier if you just can type in a group. Like this, mm -hmm. right? Ah, okay. Now I can see kind of blurry, but I can still see something. Right, it's yeah. visible or not, or is it just me? I can see it's visible. Yeah, we, we are sharing the, the screen, yeah. so you are. Yeah. But I mean, as I said, I have a lot of books. I, I, I even for, by the way, also another nice book is this from Kuljevic. Uh, he, he wrote uh, several, uh, Kuljevic, uh, he wrote uh, several couple books about uh, also uh, Adinas, uh, about this Elo, some are above, and, but he made a couple of books, right? He wrote something like three books. Uh, so he had Kuljevic. Okay, I will check this book. So he made several books, which I also find quite interesting. Another is a serial, is this, uh, which I use quite often. And I think it's quite nice. It's a little bit like this uh, serial, so with 1,001 puzzles. Always keep in mind that, uh, that uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a video, so you can always see in hindsight, right? You can always look back. 
But of course, it was much easier if we if we had a WhatsApp, and then we can just send you the pictures, and then everything is there. So for me, also, I said, why we don't have WhatsApp group? But that's a sad. It's not up to me to create such kind of things. It's all uh, another thing which I really use and really love is this manual of combinations. There are a couple of books of them, and again, but it's very quickly. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of books are already step four and higher so it means that it's really advanced level so it's not for the very beginning right uh, especially also these books uh, the first one the blue one is around till step three but the, the yellow book is already from step four and up so keep in mind that these are i mean these are more the books for where daniel was talking about 1200 and plus right because 1200 1500 those books the last ones they are more for them i think for the for the as I said, for the younger ones, it's just take the step method tutor, basic things. It's more than enough. And especially those mini games. I think the mini games are just, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a question. One more time, you can add me. I'm more than happy to join the group, uh, answer some of your questions. Um, but again, again, I think you have to take the right in your own hands and, and create it and just start. And then everybody who wants to join will join. Everybody who doesn't like it, then don't. And I think uh, that's I, the best way to sorry proceed. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to answer Monica. And then actually, I, everybody who wants to join the group can add my WhatsApp. OK. Um, so keep in mind that this is recorded. I don't mind. My telephone number is already on my website. So my, my telephone number is not a secret anymore. Even if you write just trainer in Dutch, you will get my location. So it's like it's uh, in some ways good and some ways bad. It's just uh, there's no privacy anymore. So uh, so just keep in mind that these kind of details. And if you don't want to be shared, then just send them a personal message. Right. Good. Um, let us round this up. Uh, then uh, sh should I still keep it open for you to communicate or can you communicate in different ways too with each other? Yeah, so maybe if you can write now the personal to uh, from Alice or Monica and then from there on you can create the, the group. Maybe that's the easiest way. Okay. Uh, we leave the meeting. I don't know if you'll turn off now, but I need yeah. to take care then, of my 